Thanks for tuning in. Hi, I'm Beth Heener from HXGN TV. Well, today we have Paolo Gulamini, and he's the CEO from MSC Software with us to discuss how smarter design is supporting the smart factory. Paolo, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm great. We just I'm discussed great. you're from Italy, and so I guess Vegas is a home away from home for you. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of familiar faces, <laughs> familiar accents. Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, good. Well, let's just jump right in. Yep. How can we design smarter from the get-go? Um, so at um, MSC Hexagon, we are on a mission to try and uh, extend the set of tools that engineers use uh, normally to make sure that we give uh, right at their fingertips as much relevant, relevant information as possible to make sure that they make design choices that are suited for the process and, uh, and that match the, uh, uh, the business priorities uh, that they want to handle. Um, we're focusing on six areas. Okay. Yeah? Six areas. We want to try and give them as accurate responses as possible. So right. quality comes first. Make sure that when they use our tools, the response that we give in terms of the, uh, the relevancy, the accuracy of our responses mm -hmm. of the simulation results, are as strong and reliable as possible. So quality comes first. Productivity, super important. So we're using artificial intelligence techniques. Mm. Uh, we want to make sure that they get the most out of their historical simulation mm. runs. They get the most out of their engineering teams. Mm. So productivity in terms of uh, the most level of insights from the install base of uh, um, kind of licenses and, and, and the wealth of functionalities of software that we have, uh, that we have provided them. Productivity certainly second. Um, usability, very important. Yes. Yeah? So um, a lot of our customers have a fairly uh, young uh, and growing population of engineers. They go through uh, sort of generational changes mm. and uh, they want to maintain the level of usability uh, as uh, agile as possible to the needs of these uh, millennials? These millennials as well, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I would say usability means a few things. Uh, interoperability across the products, so being able to learn one environment or as limited of a number of environments as possible. So okay. be familiar with the environment you work with. Uh, and also having an environment that is tailored to the goals you're trying to achieve. Right. Yeah. So let's modify these user interfaces mm. in a way that matches the design goal. Yeah, or the simulation goal. And then, increasingly, we're trying to bring more and more notions at the point of design. Yeah? So, we talk about manufacturability, sustainability, costing. Yeah? So, we want to make sure that design choices take into account uh, as many of possible of these dimensions. Can I manufacture the component that I've just designed? I can go through a whole design process and come up with a design options that is actually non-manufacturable. Right. Yeah? A lot of organizations are set up in a way that doesn't allow them to, uh, to screen these design options out of the preliminary process. The so they're not, process. it's not really practical. So you exactly. can design, but it's not practical to make. Exactly. Okay. You don't want to be designing uh, a concept, throwing off the fence to manufacturing to then know that that part is going to become costly, non-affordable, non-sustainable, non-manufacturable. Yeah? Uh, when it comes to costing, another super important dimension of design mm -hmm. that currently uh, simulation tools don't allow you to account for. Yeah? Mm. We have a lot of experience, exposure at Hexagon uh, to the rest of the design process, also contrary to most of our competitors that tend to be very, very focused on that dimension, on the virtual world. We have a presence in the digital and the physical world, mm. and that gives us a lot of information that we can make available uh, at the point of design. Right. Uh, and the same is true for sustainability. Yeah? Yeah. So today, a lot of the tools that designers have don't allow them to uh, discard design options that consider materials that necessarily are not allowed in certain jurisdictions. Mm. Yeah? So we want to make sure that all of this expertise around compliance and sustainability is embedded in our tool from the get-go. Yeah. And is that like geolocated then, or? Yeah, it could be. It certainly is related to the various jurisdictions. Right. Yeah? There's clearly there's a there's a variety. Yes. Uh, but we want to make sure that those compliance information, sustainability notions that uh, involve your supply chain, 
are available from the get-go. Yes. Oh man, lots of information there. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. So how do you make design and engineering simulation have more connectivity with business imperatives? Well, I think the uh, these six concepts that we've talked about are going to greatly help. Do that, yes. Um, our customers want to get to market first. Yeah, mm -hmm. so time to market, super important. They want to build an edge for themselves, so differentiating their products, and they want to do it efficiently. Right. You know, with, uh, with optimal uh, utilization of resources, uh, with the best cost footprint, yeah? I think that when we talk about manufacturability embedded in design, when we talk about costing notions being part of design choices, we already help them greatly. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I also think that Hexagon is a manufacturer, yeah? mm -hmm. so we manufacture our own devices. We go through a very similar struggle to the one that a lot of our customers go through. So the fact of being a software vendor, but a manufacturer at the same time, uh, puts us in a very advantageous position to support them in, in their mission. Yes, absolutely. All right, so let's move on to sustainability then in the context of design and engineering simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you've touched so, on it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, as we discussed, uh, it's got to do with jurisdictions. It's got to do with handling uh, a global supply chain and a global distribution of products. Yeah. Right. Nobody can, without a professionally built and maintained tool, have all of that wealth of information. Uh, from our standpoint, we look at material choices as being um, one of our. Uh, areas of specialty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a um, we have an ambitious uh, but very well established strategies around material that's mm -hmm. got to do with material properties. Let's make sure that our manufacturers have across the board in all of their operations available material properties uh, at a great level of detail and in a way that is well structured across for utilization. It's got to do with virtual material development. Yeah, so increasingly you can mine the data lakes that have got to do with materials, apply artificial intelligence, and start to forecast material properties for new material types that you might want to develop. Yeah? Um, if you look at a car model today versus 20 years ago versus in 20 years, the, the number of materials that uh, we're using today and we're going to be using in the future is way more diversified than in the past. Right. Yeah, there's much more research that has got to do with, uh, with uh, material properties today and development. We look at things like virtual allowables uh, embedded in our, in our platform. A lot of research goes into multi-scale modeling, light weighting, right weighting, yeah? So we want to help our customers to make the right material choices for their design objectives, yes. and we want sustainability to be part of our backbone. Mm. Yeah, and add this incremental dimension as one of the ones that they can use to not only be compliant, but build diversification in the marketplace. Excellent, excellent. And I know Ulu was touching <laughs> on sustainability too, yeah. and just as a wonderful hexagon objective yeah. moving forward. Uh, so how do you see computer-aided engineering simulation continuity Mm -hmm. across physical types, so that would be structural, fluids, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I think this is something that has been obviously worked on in the industry for a very long time. Uh, we're working on two initiatives, uh, I would say, that uh, are going to be stand out in the, in the industry. We obviously have an accomplished portfolio of uh, multi-physics. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that we're ready to execute on those uh, continuously. So yes chained simulation and concurrent simulation. So we have uh, two initiatives, one we call Apex Framework. Mm. So we basically are creating a front end for all of our physics that is going to allow our customers to execute in chained simulation a multiplicity mm. of these physics. Yeah? When it comes to systems, when it comes to structures, fluids, acoustics, thermal impacts, etc. We have a second initiative that is going to allow them to actually execute on these physics at once. Yeah, so have these solvers that talk to each other as they execute. Yeah, for for best performance and uh, for best reliability of uh, of design outcomes. 
Wow, Paolo, thank you so much. <laughs> very, very informative. We appreciate you being here with us and sharing thank some you of your bet. knowledge with us. Of course. If you'd like more information on today's topic, you can visit hxgnspotlight.com and also catch more episodes again at hxgnspotlight.com. Thank you for tuning in.